one of the things um, I came up with was something which I've riffed on before um, at Cyber Salon a few years ago. There is on YouTube a video of a quite drunk me um, talking about how my generation failed to all, and I'm sorry, um, and I wish we could do something about it. And it seemed like a useful theme for tonight because this is a movement of hope. Um, it is a place to have fun and to imagine a future and try to come back from what there has been um, and build something better. And to take our creative imagination and intelligence uh, and our love for each other and turn that into a set of systems which will underpin a society we might want to want to live in, as opposed to something we just have to tolerate. And so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about why I think we fail and what are what some of the failures were. Um, so I'm born 62 now, and so I grew up without computers, and it was in my late teens when I first started using them. And I first used the internet in 1985, when there were a few hundred thousand people online, because it was just there. It was there at my university and then one of my early employers. And today's actually the internet's 40th and nine days birthday because the internet came into existence on the 1st of January 1983, when a number of networks like BitNet, SatNet and MilNet, the military network, switched over from something called the Network Control Protocol to TCPIP, to Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, developed by a number of people, but primarily and principally Vince Cerf and Bob Cum, who were relatively young men at the time. And they created these technical standards that have sustained the network since then. And it may be at version 6 for some of you, version 4 for many other people, but it's still recognisably the same TCPIP, and it still has all of the same flaws that have given us um, the Great Wire Firewall of China, and surveillance capitalism, and spam, and trolling, and hate speech, and all the things we hate. And it was the mistake of optimism made by those two great engineers, because they were great engineers, and they failed to consider the human element of what they And so one of the ways in which we failed was to fail to realize that the internet would not always be used by people who resembled white male graduate students from the west coast of America, oddly enough, and that it might be necessary to think about the needs and interests of a wider group of people, and also what might happen when bad actors got onto the network, which this was not designed so. And then that error was propagated by the way the early internet was managed. Um, some of you may be familiar with the name John Postel, who called it the internet. And John Postel was a sort of middle-aged man with a long beard, and for many years he was responsible for handing out IP addresses, as in that was his job. He ran something called the Internet Assigned Numbers um, Association, and John was the person who gave you blocks of IP addresses to connect your computers and systems to the internet. The whole thing was run basically by him. And that's great when it's a relatively small, um, non-commercial network that's being used primarily and principally by uh, academic researchers and a bit of government and quite a lot of military. Uh, it doesn't scale. And it doesn't, again, allow for the fact that this network is going to grow to something which will be very significant in the world. It has no checks and balances in it. So that was another way in which we failed to think about how this network would develop, uh, what it would become, and what might be necessary to have in place to protect us from the bad side of it. And then a really nice guy, a friend of mine, Tim Berners-Lee, um, in the 1980s was working on hypertext and hypertext systems and he came up with a, with a system called Enquire Within About Everything which was sort of, the idea was um, a way to link documents together by having the hypertext link between them and eventually that turned into the World Wide Web and the first implementation of the World Wide Web he defined a markup language, HTML, or bastardized SGML if you want to think about it, basically take all the good things from the standard general markup language and rip them out and you're left with something which is barely adequate to the job, but anyone can use. And you know, trade checks and balances. But he also created the Hypertext Transport Protocol. And he made what I think is a fundamental design error, which is he made HTTP stateless. That is, when a server set, gets an HTTP, HTTP request from a browser, it deals with the request and it forgets it. And if the same browser comes back with another request, it's just another request. Now, this is very lightweight. 
to say that. It's very efficient. Uh, it allows websites to be thrown up quite quickly. It makes it much easier to implement web server code. So it helps the web grow really fast as, as a way of, as information and management system. But if you want to do anything which requires a state, you need to have some mechanism whereby the server and the browser can communicate, say, hey, it's me again. And that thing is the cookie. And the cookie is the basis of surveillance capitalism. And if we build the web in the first instance in a more complex way, with the state between browser and server, and we knew how to do it at the time in the 90s, because there were systems out there, ex-Windows systems, and we made dozens of cookies, but buzzed in the state. But also there was something called the Advanced Network Systems Architecture. Look it up, it was a great UK project. A friends of mine worked on it in the 80s. We knew how to do distributed computing really quite effectively. It wasn't efficient, because the machines at the time were not powerful enough, and the networks weren't fast enough, but we had an understanding of how to do it. But because Tim's desire was to build something which anyone could use in his way, and because he wasn't thinking about, well, how might this backfire on us, he implemented something which has led to the current situation in which every time you try to do anything on the web, you'll be in monitors and survey. And the, 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 the uh, war of attrition between advertisers and those who are quite not, not, not to be surveyed. And so these are just some examples of how. People have made decisions in good faith which have backfired on us and which have led to today's internet. And to some extent, I'm one of those people as well, because back in the uh, mid 90s, I was the early 90s, 1995, I was working in the Guardian newspaper, um, and I was head of new media and was asked to build the first Guardian website, Guardian.com. Okay. I ran and built it with some friends in VI, VI Editor. Um, it ran on a little um, silicon graphics box on my desk. Um, for those of you of an age, um, I had to adjust the network bit switches with a screwdriver to get it to talk to the network. You know, this is primitive technology. And I felt at the time strongly that the path to success for the Guardian was that the site should be free. So, so no, no registration, no data capture, fine, but also just you know, no charging levels. And this was done you know, in good faith, and I persuaded the then editor, Alan Westbridger, and uh, the board of the Guardian, the, the owners of the Guardian, Scott Cuss, that it was a good idea, and we did it. But it had a lot of consequences for the rest of the newspaper industry, as it was taking the Guardian 25 years to return to profit, sorry. Um, but also, it was one of those things where there was a failure of imagination on my part, and Tim's part, and John Costell's part, and Vinny and and Bob's part, to properly envisage the future that these technologies would be embedded in, and to allow for that. To, to do design thinking rather than technical thinking. <clears throat> we acted too much just like engineers instead of considering where might this take us and what would be the unexpected consequences or indeed the desired consequences of it. We were just dumb. And this idea now, you just have you know, unfettered innovation that you know, we see it happen today. What is chat GPT? But the biggest mass experiment in human neuroscience since they faked the research data and released aspartame and put it in dark. You know, it is essentially a mass experiment in how gullible we all are. And it's going to have many untoward consequences going forward. But there's nothing to stop that happening. And the engineers behind it, although they say they're trying to do it responsibly, have built a technology that is transformative, made it available with minimal sort of guardrails and protections, and made it visible in the world. And I think we're seeing that continuing again and again. And one of the reasons to be inspired by being us here tonight, by what else happens in other sort of hacking, hacking places, from my own experience uh, working with uh, My Society, the UK based charity, first part of civic society project, which I was involved with from the early days with its founder, Tom Steinberg, is that there are enough people around now to push back against them. And to think that, think about how we embed technology in society, think about the social technical aspects of it. It's one of the founding principles of Newsweek Paris that we link these things together. And so we want the technical innovation, but we want to do it in a framework that is, that is humane and understands people, that considers those potential downsides, that considers the wider societal impact, that considers a population slightly more diverse than the bunch of, so typically from 30 years ago, white men in the room, 
and goes beyond that. Uh, and so this is why I was very happy to say he has to come along this evening because what we're doing here is both inspirational and vital. And I do think if we look back, we can see you know, in the sort of um, events I've described, these, these points in history where perhaps we could have made it better. And we didn't. We either chose not to, or we just didn't think carefully enough about the consequences of the technical choices we were making and how they would play out in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So as you think about the systems tonight, I'd say, you know, that's one of the things to think about. Suppose this becomes the biggest and most important technological innovation of the century so far. How would it work for an indigenous population in another country? How would it work for disadvantaged people? How would it work for those people who are threatened in various ways in their lives? Rather than just every excitement take on the biggest innovation of the So that's why I wanted to say that. So I have to answer questions, have conversations. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a radio journalist. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. To put it more on negligence at the time or, or difficulty to forecast, it sounds like a hard thing to forecast what, what's going to be the state of society in 20 years from now, you know, with the current scenario and how the tools may evolve as well. In yeah. that case, it didn't really evolve much, you would simply be implying that current protocols are nearly the same as the first the TCPIP, but. Is it still a doable thing or reasonable thing to be able to? Um, is it still worth trying? <laughs> but that's a that's a really good question. I mean, yes, obviously I'm being harsh, uh, but then I can afford to be harsh because you've given me a gum seat on me. I'm in front of you, so um, I'm, there's an element of performance there. Um, I think it is worth trying, and I think the tools do exist um, for us to push forward. And just we just don't want to do that because it's extra effort. Um, I'm a big fan of the sort of scenario planning, which is not about trying to anticipate the future, but being prepared for the future, as in thinking through certain circumstances and helping that inform the choices you make today. And I don't think we've ever tried to build that into um, the innovation pipeline, particularly for, for large companies, and it's something that I would encourage. So it won't ever be perfect, but it's just not being done at all in, in what I saw. In my own experience as an engineer and software developer, we just got on with it. And I think these technologies are too powerful and important for us to be, just to, for, for that to continue to be. Thanks. Have you got any favourite positive examples where it was done better at scale? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but it won't be popular. <laughs> Um, well, the App Store on uh, iOS was actually a very good example of uh, Steve Jobs taking his whole particular moralistic framework and saying, I will try very hard to make this technology not be used for ill. So, yes, <laughs> may not be one that's living, but... Did you elaborate more on that? Um, well, sort of from the very beginning, uh, the Apple ecosystem was controlled. Obviously, it served their commercial purposes incredibly well. Yeah. But it also, and um, from reading John's biography and sort of seeing John listening to him talk and stuff like that, it was something which mattered a lot to him as, as, a, as a human being, no. uh, and as sort of who, who cared about others, that, that the tools that he was putting out in the world, he would try to minimise the damage that could, be, that could be done through them. And so by designing the, the um, iOS um, app store in a, in a closed way with validation, he did, he tried. I'm not saying succeeded, but he tried to build an environment that would be safer for people, and in which the things which he felt were important, his particular value system, was embodied in that. Um, I could give another example, but it's a bit self serving, <laughs> <laughs> which is the BBC, obviously. I mean, the BBC is basically an engineering organisation with quite a nice broadcaster attached, uh, as in, it was founded 100 years ago, 1922, in order to deliver the benefits of the emerging technology radio communications into the world in a controlled way which would bring, bring the best to people and minimise harm. And that those principles have tried to have driven it since then, however perfectly imperfectly. So that's another way where you know we, we develop it. I think part of the problem with that, back to my theme, is that if you're a broadcaster making radio or television and getting it into the world, almost any technical innovation is a good thing. 
Stereo, fantastic. Color, brilliant. 65 lines instead of 45, fantastic. 8405, fantastic. And we made them all that place because we believe that the broadcast material itself is good for people, so getting it to them more efficiently is also good. Once you move to the BBC online, that means you see some of the same lines. There are innovations in the technology that may not be good for people. Oh, look, we can track when people click on this thing, and we can see who's visiting these websites. So perhaps BBC's viewers do not want to be turned into um, sort of, you know, sort of um, tracked individuals. So you have to face a different set of questions once you have two way technology that has been embedded in it with the capabilities for surveillance. I'm not sure that BBC would be placed up for it. But as a broadcaster, but can I ask, um, yeah. what do you think is the danger of the, is it chat GPT? Chat GPT, this is this, this is the large language model that will generate you plausible words in a particular order um, on demand. It's, it's based on, on work that this will be, chat GPT is coming from companies called OpenAI and others out there as well. And it's this idea that we've managed to build machine learning systems that can do, that bring in very large volumes of, of textual material from all over the internet and analyze the statistical significance of wording and therefore can do what I think of as a drunkard's walk through language. And on each word, they find the most plausible next word and they spit it out. And we as human beings then take that and add meaning to it and think it is significant. And they're just rolling that out. And while there's no actual connection to the real world, to the factual world, of the output of these systems, they're being used to do things like generate student essays and sort of helpline text and advice for people who are going through mental health distress and stuff like that, because it's a very shortcut way of generating plausible text and taking meaning to So it's this, this again, it's just it's a particular technology which I think it's, it's on my mind at the moment. It's on my and again, it's in some countries we've done it. We could do it, should we have done it? We should be doing it in this way. And it's sort of a bit too late to tell you. I have some questions. It's yeah. for someone that's very aware that the technology impacts the regulation and all of the values. But as someone new or small or young, when we create technology, often that we don't have the time, we don't have the resources. And then you just need to build something fast and you need to do a lot of workarounds. And then you don't have the money. So when the investor, you come present that to investor and the investor say, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. And then you have a, wait, nowadays when you start a new technology, you're going to use many pieces, many libraries, and you don't know what is behind that. So I guess my question is for me to create something that can be, that can compete in the market and make mm -hmm. people to use it is already so hard. How can I make it with all the ethical things I want to put in it and people are still going to use my product? Because other product teams, they don't care. And they sometimes they don't care. They make better products to attract Not better. the investor. You, you're using the word better. Sorry. You know, you, 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 so you were doing, it's a brilliant question. I just challenged the word better. Yeah. Um, they make products that they can sell more effectively, make more money from, that seem to be easier. But they're not better for society or the world, or even possibly for the individuals using them. Yeah. And I would say that's the hinge that, that trying to understand what better looks like, what good looks like. Um, one answer, the unhelpful answer is well, then you just have to make some sacrifices, aren't you? But I wouldn't, and that's not my answer. Um, so I have argued for, for many years <clears throat> that. One thing we need to do to fix the internet is to make it easier to regulate. That is, to, to refine the core protocols to make it possible for government to pass laws and for those laws to be enforced. And this is a quite controversial position because it then relies on the government to do the right thing. And friends, colleagues, enemies, lots of people have said to me that you know, the internet has to, actually has to be free um, so we can do what we want. This is an argument I have with my friend. Come uh, Doctoro and John Zitrain and some of the people like that, and you can sort of lead their thinking. My view is different, which is that I think as a society, indeed as a species, we should be building technologies which can be regulated and then winning the political argument to regulate them in the right way. But the, the locus of, of the challenge 
should be that we get government, we are the government in the sense of democratic government, we persuade them to regulate in a way which makes the product of the socially concerned entrepreneur work better in the market because the cost of regulation is so high for the people who want to take, take the shortcuts, who would do the bad thing. And I say, I understand this is a controversial position because what it means is you end up giving uh, the Chinese government the tools of oppression and better tools of oppression than they currently have with the great farm. And then we have to say, well, politically, I'm then going to argue for radical political transformation in that country to make a change, and people say, well, that's never going to happen. And, you know, then, but you're then having a political argument rather than a technology argument. And I think that this is an area where we've disregarded the political realm a bit too much and allowed the technology to shape what is possible. And I would quite like to move things up a level to where we're having the serious political arguments and then the technology serves those political goals. I don't think we've properly managed to do that. However, getting there from here is going to be hard and messy and not be good for a lot of people. So um, it's, not a, it's not a situation I'm entirely reconciled to. But my thinking, my answer to your question would be, make a world in which doing the right thing is also profitable. But it's easy for me to say that, because I'm sitting on the cups. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, one so question in the back. Sorry, are we out of time? The last one, we are off the time. Be very brief. I will be brief, and you can talk later. Yeah. Um, ask away. This is great. Uh, so, well, thank you for being the person who set the precedent Guardian should be free to read online or field games and live books. Like, 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 <laughs> if you feel vindicated, it just makes sense at this point. Um, what do you think about the notion which I'm seeing uh, being stated more and more that the internet has opened some people's minds and not everybody should have access to it? <sighs> So I'm reading a really interesting book at the moment called At the Existentialist Cafe, which is about the uh, Beauvoir and Sartre and Arras and uh, their, the history of existentialism. And I've just gone to a bit where it's talking about um, Heidegger's uh, theory of being versus a uh, German philosopher who I haven't known before called Jaspers, Jaspers, theory of being, and about our connection to the, the, the world in itself. And that is, I've been thinking the same thoughts that this ability to connect to everyone and everything all at once is actually fundamentally damaging to our sense of connection to ourselves as, as beings embodied in the world. So three days ago I said that just with some bit of pop psychology. Now I think there might be a fundamental philosophical issue about the nature of the world that the network brings to us and the challenge it, the challenge it creates for our ability to form a coherent model of the world in which we can be agents and active. So I know that was very uh, blurry. Um, so it's not that individuals might need to be sort of kept offline for their own good, but that I think there could be something undermining in what the network has done over the past particular last 10 years that can only probably be accounted for by the philosophers. And as a song of the philosophy to me myself, I'm obviously available for the work and any time. Um, but so I think there's there's something going on, yes. And I think it, but it is a proper philosophical investigation rather than a pop psychology investigation. Mm. That's how it yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and good book. Oh. Oh. There was like and who wants to ask Bill more questions? We can be a breakout session to yeah, continue sure. talking yeah. to you. Yeah, and I'm okay. very easy to find on the internet. Yes. Okay. Before it ends. Master.